the theme for this year's conference is One Gulf, Healthy Ecosystems, Healthy Communities. And the Gomri Executive Committee uh, well understands the need to continue to emphasize human health and healthy ecosystems. They're tightly bound and they both need to be well understood in the context of the Gulf oil spill. So we crafted an interdisciplinary approach to the uh, week's sessions with extension, uh, very extensive rather inclusion of public health topics and um, social science disciplines. We need to understand public health in, in view of the capacity of the social sciences. We have just about a thousand attendees um, registered for this conference uh, from 35 states and 15 countries. So this represents really a, a massive gathering to understand the effects of the Deepwater Horizon spill and to serve that, um, to serve as a model for understanding any spills that may occur in the future. So this is a pretty impressive meeting. We have 18 sessions with about 280 spoken presentations and 250 posters. So the next three days will highlight interdisciplinary science, and that's generally the theme, interdisciplinary science. The poster sessions take place tonight and tomorrow night. Um, there'll be those 250 posters, and the posters are um, being held in the convention center, which is attached to the Marriott, the hotel we're in right now. The session organizers, to whom we express our sincerest appreciation for bringing together the diverse and very interesting topics. Um, the sessions um, will have a rapporteur or a report out at the closing plenary, plenary. So that final session will be a summary of all that takes place in the past two days. And it'll be followed by our first documentary, Dispatches from the Gulf. Uh, this is the 14th in the series uh, Journey to Planet Earth that is shown on um, television. Hal and Marilyn Weiner, the uh, co-producers, are here at the meeting, and they will be uh, able to um, present an introduction to the documentary on the final day. So we start the conference today with a discussion about scientific data, the need for transparency, the need for accessible data, for the data that contribute to understanding a healthy, sustainable gulf. We're in an era of big data, and our keynote speaker, Dr. Marsha McNutt, will set the stage for a panel discussion. You see these comfortable chairs here for the panel discussion, for a timely discussion of the necessity to share data, preserve data, and to maintain the data banking well into the future. Now, if we had had all the data of the past oil spills that have occurred around the world, as well as in the US, over the past 50 years, we'd have a much, much better understanding, a more clear picture of oil impacts, and we would be able to better address restoring the Gulf of Mexico and the communities around the Gulf to uh, their natural situation. It's the wealth, the gold of science, the data that we gather. It needs to be shared, collated, and intercollated uh, so that we have meaning, value, and utility. So now it's my genuine pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Marsha McNutt. Dr. McNutt is currently Editor-in-Chief of Science Magazine, uh, published by AAAS. Prior to joining Science as its 19th Editor-in-Chief and the first woman to hold that position, Marsha served as head of the U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, where she played a very important role in the government's response to the Deepwater Horizon spill. So she's been here 
before, and she knows the region. Before that, she was president and chief executive officer of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and a professor of geophysics at Stanford. Um, she began an academic career at MIT, and recently, Masha was nominated to stand for election as the next president of the National Academy of Sciences, the NAS, if elected, and we sincerely hope so. Masha will be um, the first woman to head the U.S. government's premier science advisory organization, which was established by President Lincoln in 1863. So Masha, please take the podium. We look forward to your discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Rita, and welcome everyone to this wonderful conference, and thank you so much for inviting me to be your keynote speaker. The title of my talk is One Gulf, Perspectives on Environmental and Health Data for Advancing Science and Informed Decision Making. I'm really pleased to be talking about a topic which is uh, so uh, important to me, and that is the importance of transparency and openness in data sharing. This is something that's been uh, something of a crusade of mine since I became Editor-in-Chief of Science. And in some respects, this is a, almost a movement which is transforming science across multiple disciplines because of a number of trends, whether it's the importance of big data, as Rita just mentioned, or the issue of reproducibility in science, um, concerns that have been raised that in a number of fields, people have noticed that some of the science we've uh, published has not been reproducible. And if we can't get at the original data, it's hard to understand what is replicable. Um, so, but it's also the immense amount of money that goes into collecting data in the first place. It is very expensive to uh, recreate that data collection if we haven't made the data accessible uh, to others who come after. So I sort of felt for a very long time, um, the past couple years, that we were on a steady uh, progress to more accessible, more transparent, um, more um, readily available data. And then, suddenly, there seemed to be this step backwards. When recently, a medical journal that I will not name, but you may see its initials in the next slide, um, came out with an editorial uh, just in the past couple weeks that uh, took uh, a different view. The editors of this medical journal uh, said that they were concerned that data sharing, if widely encouraged, would produce a new class of data parasites, in their term. That, um, according to them, that someone else could be using my data only to, <gasps> whores, disprove my results. Well, you know, in my view, isn't that how science moves forward? If your results are wrong, shouldn't maybe someone show that? And uh, they were concerned that those not involved in the original research will not uh, know how to use the data. Well, that is a concern, and that's something that needs to be addressed through appropriate use of metadata, et cetera. And this um, journal uh, instead proposed that a better approach would be that if you want to use someone else's data, you should collaborate with the original authors invite them to be co-authors on your study 
as a condition to use the data. So that was their preferred approach. Well, the response from the Twitter sphere was immediate and very reactive. Uh, it produced, if I can get this to go forward, little pictures like this, um, where uh, it showed this um, uh, little uh, closed castle that said, uh, reproducibility crisis, nonsense. Um, and it showed um, this little data parasite on the outside trying to get in to get the data and being blocked out um, by this um, uh, uh, blockade from uh, the NEJM. Um, and uh, uh, basically, um, the uh, scientists were not happy about this idea. So. Um, Basically, um, reproducibility is, is but one reason why uh, one would want to get access to data. This is uh, one paper that we recently published in Science um, that was done by uh, a group of scientists as part of the Open Science Collaboration, uh, which they took 100 of the most prominent studies in psychology and tried to reproduce them. And it was crowdsourced, um, the uh, reproduction. And what they found was actually quite interesting. Of the 100 landmark studies in psychology, they found that less than 40% could be reproduced. Now, um, this is uh, important it doesn't necessarily mean that the original study was wrong. It could mean that the reproduction was wrong. But it did show that one had to um, take with uh, a little bit of skepticism the conclusions in the original study. Even those that were reproduced generally were reproduced with less statistical significance than the original study. And what they found was those that were reproduced were the ones that originally had the highest statistical significance to begin with, and those that had been barely at the level of statistical significance generally were the ones that could not be reproduced. So this was a very important finding, all that was done through re reproduction. Now, that study is uh, a little bit um, uh, beside the point because these reproductions were all done by collecting new data. In most of the field sciences, which is what we're doing here, let me get this to, where am I putting this? Here we go. In the field studies, which we're doing here, collecting new data is generally not possible. Whether we're talking about something like the Tohoku earthquake uh, from Japan, or the Gulf oil spill. If we want to check someone else's results, we can't recreate the Tohoku earthquake. We can't recreate the Gulf oil spill. If the data aren't available, no one can check to see whether we agreed with someone else's result. And that is why replicability depends on the availability of previously published data. So um, that is the foundation in the field sciences. We can't go back and redo it. In addition, uh, in the field sciences, we're always dealing with the vector of time. So even if it's not a crisis like uh, these two cases, even if we're just talking about climate change, we can't go back and turn back climate change. We can't turn back a forest succession. We can't turn back uh, changes in uh, endangered species. So we have to preserve the data because it's never the way it used to be. It's not like laboratory sciences um, where one can actually uh, take a little specimen in the lab or chemistry and actually recreate exactly the conditions in the lab and do a perfect replication. 
We're never going to be doing that with the field sciences. And it's also hard to include everyone as co-authors. Um, uh, I just threw up this slide to say that um, I, I did a study um, uh, once in which I did a, a huge synthesis of data from the South Pacific, uh, including some data of my own and data of everyone who had gone before. Um, one um, uh, ship track of data I included uh, had been collected by Captain Cook. Now, was I going to include Captain Cook as a co-author? No. So it's not the, the idea from this journal that I was going to collaborate with everyone who had produced the data and include them as co-authors um, is not always feasible or practical. In addition, proper scientific ethics says, and this is important particularly for young people in the audience, if you include someone as a co-author, there are no such things as honorary co-authors. Co-authors are responsible for the scientific integrity of what's in your paper. And if they're dead, they can't do that, okay? So if you put someone on as a co-author, they have to agree with the findings in your paper. And you can't just put them on because they, uh, they supplied some data. So um, if, if they're actually on as a co-author, they have to materially participate in the conduct of the research. And you can imagine if you've got data that's been supplied by um, 30, 40, 50 different people, and you're going to try to come to some consensus from those 30, 40, 50 different people, and maybe some of them have already published papers that came to different findings, and now you want them all to agree with your results, I think science is going to come to a halt. So it's much better to set up data repositories, people put the data in the repositories, and then you come to your conclusions and you don't get weighed down by all these co-authors. Well, there we go. So um, now, granted, sharing data is not cheap. We need to fund data repositories. We need to support data professionals to make sure there's good quality control. We need to create apps that automate data deposition and extraction. That's what makes it easy. You collect the data, your app automatically puts it in the format, puts it in the data repository. The app automatically takes it out of the data repository, lets you use it, lets you plot it, lets you analyze it. And we have to educate all in the importance of quality control. Um, that's all part of it. And sharing is not easy. We have to establish metadata standards. Um, as an example of that, uh, one thing we had to do in the ocean science community was decide how do we define temperature at zero for the ocean? Is it the shallowest depth that a CTD can measure in the ocean? Or is temperature at zero the shallowest depth that an Argo float can measure in the ocean? Or as temperature at zero, if I sampled water from the ocean surface and put a thermometer in it, is that temperature at zero? Or is temperature at zero, zero atmospheric pressure, which would actually be an, uh, an air temperature? We all have to agree what is T zero for the ocean. And if we don't agree, the, you can't interpret what's in the database. And we need cultural changes to relinquish ownership of the data and to start treating data as citable objects. That's the only way that the person who provided the data gets credit for it. You get credit not through authorship, you get credit through a citation to the data that you provided. And citation is the credit of the realm. You want that citation. So what are journals doing? Well, here's a, um, a uh, publication in science uh, promoting an open research culture. Um, these are called the TOP standards, which stands for transparency and openness promotion. 
These were uh, published this summer in Science, uh, a number of authors, including me on this, um, that uh, established a number of standards to promote um, uh, openness and transparency in science, uh, including uh, data standards. Um, and now more than 500 journals have signed on to uh, these standards. And as I say, they include openness standards for both um, samples uh, and data uh, that um, should uh, help. Um, what it means is if you publish in science, you will make your data available and you will put it in um, a repository and there will be a DOI that identifies uh, where that data is. So um, that's it for me. And I'm happy to take any questions or um, talk to you uh, in the panel about this. So thank you.